So can I can I start? No, no. Let me let me give you let me make a brief introduction. Okay. okay. Okay, then thank you for um, coming today to this other session of our uh, COVID-19 research uh, conversations. And, and today I have a, a tremendous pleasure to, to have this conversation with um, uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Torres and, and Tony as other uh, members of this uh, conversation group is a is a friend over the years, and I want to ask uh, Dr. Torres to give us a brief uh, introduction of himself. Tony? Yeah, thank you very much, Julio. I'm very glad to, to be here sharing with you uh, this, this webinar. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Anthony Torres. I am professor of pulmonology and critical care at the University of Barcelona and researcher for, of, of respiratory infections for many years, for many years. So it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and, and again, following the, the, um, the theme that we have in these conversations, um, <clears throat> first, I ask uh, Tony to give us a, a little bit of an overview of what we, he considered to be the lessons learned, or, you know, he, he have here the, the, the presentation, the year of living dangerously. Uh, and after his presentation, we're going to discuss a little bit what he's doing, and then we're going to move to the second session that would be how do we how do he see uh, uh, COVID in in 2021? Then uh, Tony, you want to start with your presentation? Thank you very much. Uh, well, this is the title that I, I chose because I remember a film that uh, the title was the same, and Mel Gibson was the one of the actors and the other Sigour, Sigourney Weaver. Uh, well, I like the film and I like the title, no? Because this is this is true. A, a year, very a, year, a very difficult year. Uh, I divided my content in my personal experience, uh, uh, what we did in research and what we did in education. The personal experience, I have some personal thoughts. I want to tell you the case of my brother-in-law and some fights in the hospital. Very interesting, but we can discuss this later. Uh, look at here what happened in 1918 in Spain during the uh, so bad cold or wrongly called the Spanish influenza. And uh, this is from Burgos. Burgos is a, sit a city in the middle of Spain. And these were the recommendations. Uh, the, the virus was transmitted by a small uh, particles of saliva when talking, of coughing, the same than now. Avoid poor ventilated sp spaces. Intense house cleaning. Follow up medical advices and avoid ignorant recommendations such as smoking and drinking alcohol. And this was written in this uh, uh, official bulletin, and I think this is very interesting. <clears throat> in uh, October 4th, 1918. Personal thoughts. Uh, it came to me this sentence from Pasteur that I, I learned many years ago, and I was impressed with that. My crops will have the last word. And I think this is true. I always thought that, and that's the reason, one of the reasons I dedicated uh, my life to investigate infections, uh, respiratory infections in that case. Second reflect, what happened in China was neglected. And why? Because we, we couldn't lock down. I think we had the information December, January, even February, we could do a lot. Despite an intense preparation, for example, for SARS, I, I remember many, many meetings and many protocols and many things, SARS never came to Spain. And here, we, we did not that. And then the final, Lombardia is very close. Why they did not lock down the frontiers? It was too late. It was too late. Because we saw the cases in Lombardia. I, don't, I, don't, I cannot understand that. Let's see the case of my brother-in-law. And this case was repeated in other patients, but it was very typical uh, uh, because there was not experience. Well, he was one of the first in uh, the, the second week of, uh, he got COVID the third week of March. 
He's the di director for an institution for mental discapacities, and there was an outbreak there. This is called Fundación Catalonia. Uh, he got the COVID. He was diagnosed because he was in the foundation, not because the, the public health. The public health was failing, and uh, there was persistence of fever at day eight with cough. And then uh, I recommended a chest gray first, and the chest gray was normal. And then immediately, because I, I read the, the papers from China, I ordered a CT scan uh, according to Chinese literature. And the, the CT scan showed bilateral infiltrates. And the inform of the radiologist was COVID in resolution. And my brother-in-law called me, I am okay because my COVID is in resolution. And I said, no, you, you have to go immediately to the hospital. Uh, and, 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 and then for that reason, for that reason and others, he was not admitted to the hospital the first time after, even with the CT scan. It was unbelievable. And finally, a friend of mine, the probably somebody that you know is Arturo Huerta from Mexico, is running a, a private institution here in Barcelona. I could find an institution for him, but he almost died. Another thought, and uh, this is very sad, fights in the hospital. Infectiologists and the people of uh, global health department took the power without counting with uh, pulmonologists. And the pulmonologists were called after two weeks of a lot of admissions and uh, just as a partners. Protocols were changed constantly based on poor and small observational studies. This was, I was not uh, managing those, those protocols and they changed it from uh, hydrochloroquine to hydrochloroquine plus acetromycin, uh, REM plus rendesilin plus tosulisomab, et, et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, this, I, I, I never have done that in, in my practice. You cannot, you cannot, I, I know that you, you have nothing, but, but you have to be very careful. And then finally, the case of corticosteroids is very clear. Corticosteroids were forbidden in the hospital because uh, the examples of SARS and metaneumovirus, even the guidelines, the guidelines of survival sepsis campaign, and I think probably the, 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 the CDC or something, I don't remember very well, the cortic corticosteroids were forbidden. But then clinicians, started to, to use corticosteroids and they observed that in some patients corticosteroids uh, were, uh, were effective and then finally the studies came and this is one of the standard of treatment. Uh, we, we, we cannot cure the patients at all, all but corticosteroids work pretty well. Another problem, we ran out of protection equipment. That was terrible. That was, and for that reason, many, many, many uh, health personnel uh, got infected. And then we have to buy this equipment to China, mainly through, through Spain, through the European Union. This is another problem to discuss, very, very complicated. These are the, the hospitalized patients in Hospital Clinic Barcelona until July. Of course, now we have more, but uh, 3,543 patients and uh, a total mortality of 8% uh, of all eh, ward and ICU. And the mortality of ICU was around 30%. You will see that later on. And these are the curves of the evolution of the uh, um, beds occupied. Uh, and in intermediate care units and in the, in the ICU. This is the peak of the pandemic. You can see here, this is ICU and this is intermediate care unit. And then we had a period of stability during the summer, but then in, in September, it started again, it started and is increasing. And now we are really in the third wave. 70% <coughs> of the ICU beds in the hospital, in other hospitals, are full of COVID patients and uh, uh, a lot of infections every day. And this was due because inconsistent measures of the some holidays that we had in December, exactly the, 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 
days eight and, and nine, because it's a, the, <coughs> the national holiday, and then after Christmas. We can talk ab about Christmas eh, later on. This is important. Research. What I did about research, <coughs> I put all my research group to collect COVID data and including data for ECMOCAR. Probably you know ECMOCAR is an a, a international consortium. Uh, and one of the leaders was my previous fellow, Gianluigi Libassi, and the senior leader is John Fraser. And then from home, they were <coughs> uh, collecting data. <coughs> but I received a threatening call of one of my colleagues. And I think that I have to say that, I, I will not say the name, but this was the reality. And he said, you have to stop collecting data because you are not allowed to do that. Of course, I, go, I went first to the ethical committee and ECMOCAR and the next study that I will show to you uh, passed the IRD. And I was called to a committee in the hospital of the ICU directors of the several ICUs and I have to explain everything what I was doing. Unbelievable. And this threatening call was from one of my colleagues in this department. Okay? Or the initiation of everything. Because I had the capability through the people of my group to collect many, many data. <clears throat> but um, fortunately, I received another call at night, end of March, of the uh, director of one network in Spain, which is called Fever. Might be you are aware of that, Julio. But, uh, and then he, he told me, Tony, uh, there, there will be an important call of the central government for research. And uh, I would like that you prepare uh, a, a study, a study to apply for a grant. And I, I, I thought that uh, I should do that because I wanted to do something for my patients, for my group and for the society. And that was the opportunity. And then at the beginning, and this is important, some of my people in the group of research lost control. I have to say that because they just wanted the glory. And what was the glory? The glory is to sign first one of the uh, 90, uh, I think there are 90,000 or more, 100,000 manuscripts now. And what, what matters that? You, you are not, I said, you are not going to be quoted. This is very good, but nothing is going to change with that. I think it's better to do a good study. And then I applied as a PI for this uh, uh, institution, Instituto de Salud Carlos III, the project that what I wanted to do is to study the risk factors, personalized prognosis, and one year follow up in patients admitted to Spanish intensive care units with COVID infection. And this is called Stiveres of COVID. And I got this grant, 1,750,000 euros, that for Spain probably is one of the, 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 the highest. Uh, and, and for my career as well, this was, was a lot of money. The project hypothesis at that time, that was end of April, a significant percentage of hospital patients with COVID-19 are expected to require admission to the intensive care unit, need mechanical ventilation and receive ECMO treatment. And I think that these figures are, really are, are the reality, eh? at least in the first peak. And uh, patients who survive the acute ICU episode will have a one-year cumulative incidence of death of 40%. And those who survive will have functional respiratory sequelae, cardiovascular events, and poor quality of life at six months. And we are doing that. And I think that this is also reality. I don't know about the, the figure of 40%. Eh? Uh, it was a prospective retrospective multicenter observational study of patients admitted in Spanish ICU, uh, only Spanish ICU, and all patients eligible in each ICU recruited when possible. So we, we are recruiting all the patients. Uh, at that moment, we said 50 Spanish ICUs. Now we have 65, uh, 50,000 patients for the clinical study. Now we have uh, 6,000. 
uh, and 1,000 patients for epigenetic biomarker studies. We collected samples when possible, uh, the first 24, 48 hours. And uh, the clinical data will be analyzed using artificial intelligence for the prognosis algorithms. This was the situation in November, uh, more than 5,000 patients included, 200, uh, 2,100 completed patients, and now these figures uh, are 6,000 and uh, 2,500, and now we have more than 65 centers with uh, access to a red cap system to, to include the data. And I, I am bringing some information here. Now we are writing a paper with more, more patients, and uh, importantly, we collected this, this, the data sequentially which is I miss it in most of the publications. I mean, we have data on day one, on day three, on uh, intermediate point, uh, the day of extubation, uh, the day of ICU discharge, and the day of uh, hospital discharge, and the day of hospital admission. This is uh, this population, alive and, and dead. You can see the sex and age. Nothing is very different compared to what you have seen, and the comorbidities as well. The, the, you know, you are very aware of that. Uh, and then you can see the distribution of age and compare the life and death. Of course, the, the, the older people are, are dying more and uh, most of the patients were admitted to the ICUs with bilateral infiltrates and ARDS. Uh, no difference when comparing at admission of the hospital, leukocytes, lymphocytes, neutrophil, C-reactive protein, uh, comparing... Uh, uh, well, uh, here you can see a higher reactive protein here. Uh, uh, the LDH, the, the ferritin was uh, not very different and an ND dimer was not very different at hospital admission. Uh, equal admission versus day three. I think this is what I'm going, uh, what I am looking uh, now. And, uh, and uh, the paper will, will deal with this difference between day one of the ICU and day three. Uh, what we found in difference was that the PACO2, this is day three uh, versus uh, day one uh, for a life. And this is day, uh, uh, day one versus uh, and day three in the, the patients who died. So higher hypercamnia, higher lactate, uh, higher creatinine level, and, and higher urea. Uh, when we went to the uh, mechanical ventilation parameters, the ventilatory ratio, uh, uh, that which is a combination of the minute ventilation and the, and the PACO2, so it was one of the significant variables. Uh, the compliance as well, uh, lower compliance the patients who died, both at day one and day three. <clears throat> and uh, you can see here no difference in peak pressure, driving pressure, and um, no difference in the, uh, well, more prone position in, in patients who died. Uh, and this is because they were more sick. These are the treatments. You can see here a lot of treatments, especially at the beginning, hydroxychloroquine, then hydroxychloroquine is, is withdrawn of the project. And if you can see the, what happened with corticosteroids, no difference comparing a life to death uh, in, in, in our population. But, but this, this can be a bias, of course. Eh? And this is the, the hospital journey and uh, what happened in the, um, the patients. The patients, as you know, symptom onset, the median of uh, six days versus seven days. I think in some, in some studies, uh, the, the median time is shorter in patients with worse prognosis. Uh, this is the period of I ICU admission, uh, mechanical ventilation start, ICU discharge, uh, a median of 12 days, and uh, at the end of mechanical ventilation, 14 days, those that were uh, alive, and 26 days uh, uh, of median in the hospital discharge. Of course, the patients who died had the lower median day. Complications, uh, mainly, you can see here the complications, not big difference in terms of pneumothorax, uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, cardiac ischemia, uh, myocarditis, 
a heart attack, acute renal dysfunction uh, was higher in patients who died. This is, this is something that has been observed before and uh, no difference in hepatic dysfunction. Infectious complications, this is an interesting point, but in our study with this population, we could not find difference with, in the percentage of uh, patients alive in death in terms of pulmonary, geniturinary, and bloodstream. This is important, a lot of patients with bacteremia in both arms, and pseudomonas, enterococci, staph aureus, uh, MRSA, and candida albicans were the most frequent isolated uh, microorganisms. And in terms, and this is the, the, the final data that shows, uh, I have to minimize the screen here, that at the end, uh, 73 patients uh, were discharged alive, and in the total population, and remember that this, all these patients went to the ICU, the total uh, death rate was uh, 20, uh, 27%. Outcomes in relation to interventions, you can see here that there were no difference uh, between alive and dead patients in, in a regard prone position, a regard tracheostomy, uh, but yes, in regarding uh, renal replacement and no difference in ECMO, but uh, we had not a lot of patients at that time. Now we have more. And, uh, and this is interesting. This is data that includes more patients regarding what happened uh, day one, day three, and day of extubation. Extubation includes death, okay? And you can see lymphocytes. Uh, you can see here that the patients alive increase lymphocytes at day three. The same for platelets, uh, no difference in, in D-dimers, uh, difference uh, in decrease in ferritin here in patients that are alive. And it, this is important because there, there is a controversial issue. Interleukin-6 in blood suffered uh, a tremendous increase at day three, and this is day one in the ICU. And most of the, these patients were mechanically ventilated that day, indicating that after mechanical ventilation, there is something that goes wrong in some patients that increase uh, very importantly in, in, in interleukin-6. And uh, well, the CRP is decreasing in both in death and in alive patients at day three after ICU. Uh, this is one paper that we published from um, our, our study. The first author is Jesus Bermejo in Salamanca, and we look at the SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA emia and the viral RNA load in plasma. And you can see here that, the, and this is something that has been described as well, but uh, uh, viral RNA load in plasma is associated with critical illness and dysregulated response in COVID-19, as you can see here. Now, I think that this is already published. I can skip that one. And uh, uh, now some words about the follow-up of, of COVID. I am in charge to follow up the, the health professionals that go wrong. And really, it is very sad to see the long-term consequence that I, I observe in some of them. And I realized that I cannot do almost anything. And I thought, this is a very poor reward for them. This is something for the discussion, eh? because they, they were, they risk their lives. And then, uh, and the things are, even the, the reward was 1,500 euros uh, at the last June in the, in the salary, depending on the category. Education, the education was a, was a real challenge. Uh, I am in charge of the, the respiratory diseases uh, um, subjects in, at, at the University of, of Barcelona. And then I had to reorganize uh, all the education for students in respiratory diseases. So we have to record all the lectures, all, completely all. They could not do the, practi the practical education the last year. Now we, we found a system splitting uh, the students in, in uh, small groups, uh, many, many talks and webinars. And probably this is a shift. This will, will the consequence of this is a shift in the paradigm of the presence of, of the professor in the, 
in the lecture. And uh, uh, conclusions, these are my conclusion. Of course, one year of living in danger and we still are in danger. Uh, we were not prepared for this. Uh, uh, a great human and economical disaster. Let, we will see this, the, the economic consequence will be a disaster, are a disaster in Spain. And I, it, it is amazing that some politicians voted for death, not voted for life. And you, you know the names of three of them, very well known. And now in Spain, the elections to the Parliament of Catalonia will be February 14th. And the Catalonia government uh, decided to postpone these elections. Imagine the elections of uh, a country of 8 million persons, but the Spanish government, the Spanish government uh, refused the change of elections and now we'll have elections uh, for a politician's interest other people that voted for death. Well, but on the other hand, it was an opportunity for research and education and an opportunity to know uh, uh, solidarity and non-solidarity people. Thank you for very much for this opportunity. It was really uh, very nice to be with you, with the capo, the capo team and the capo chairman here. Uh, uh, God bless you. Tony, um, I can I can clearly uh, feel your. Um, this is so interesting that that, that this is a quote unquote uh, respiratory infection, but but your presentation is is a, is a comprehensive um, experience of of essentially all your life as a as an investigator, but there's so much. Um, social impact of this disease at every level, not at every level. Um, so many uh, questions that I would like to, to ask you, but, but some of the questions probably, I, I may say that, that um, we can probably even move into, the, into this. I, I'm going to ask you only one or two questions from the science of your research, and then I would like to move to the second part. Um, very impressive the data on, on interleukin-6 where you see this, this separation of the high levels of interleukin-6 in patients that, that die and, and low levels in patients that are alive. Uh, and this also brings you know, the, the TOSI studies or all the, the ways that we try to block interleukin-6 uh, and, and seems to be that blocking interleukin-6 didn't give us the, the effect. What do you think that, 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 what is the role? What is interleukin-6 doing? What do you see this? I, I think, well, the role of the, or the, the cause of this increase. Yeah, well, bo both. What, what do you see as interleukin-6 as a, is this the chicken, the egg? Is this, what, what do you make of this in the pathophysiology of this disease? Well, that, uh, I think despite the controversies about the storm or not the cytokine storm, uh, initially interleukin-6 as an as a overall is not so high compared to, to ARDS or sepsis of community acquired pneumonia, for example, with sepsis. This is clear. But something happens in the middle. In the middle, it means that after 48 hours of mechanical ventilation, something happens. I don't know the reason. And something happened that is very bad because then the, 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 the host cannot control this inflammation and inflammation is bad for the lung for the, and for the, all the organs. And I want to look if this is a cause of a wrong mechanical ventilation. This is one of my hypotheses, but I am not, I'm not sure of that. I have the data. Eh? I have the data. I have to see if these patients uh, have a different tidal volume, have a different, a non-protective ventilation, for example. This could be one of the reasons. 
uh, because otherwise I do not see because the, these patients are treated equally. I have to look at the treatments as well. I have to look at several things, but something is wrong between day one and three that we do or, or it is genetically marked, perhaps. I don't know. But the... No, no, but it's important to, but you've been thinking about this and I can see your thought process. Then, then you... Then, based on your thought process, do you think that the, that the, that somehow the the quote unquote respiratory failure of COVID and the and the and the pathophysiology at the at the alveolar capillary level, do you think that this is that this virus is doing something different that that they will require some form of different type of ventilatory approach? Do you think? Well, I, I, I the, the the problem not the ventilatory approach is protective ventilation for everybody. But uh, this is not so different because it's very, what is protective ventilation? This includes a low tidal volume, less than six uh, or six cc's per kilo and a plateau pressure of, of 30. But I don't know about, so again, we have to look at the deltas because with the deltas we will know, but not all the patients are similar. These patients are elderly. One, they have comorbid conditions, COPD, for example. Others have other diseases. And then not everybody basically has the same compliance in the lung. And then maybe we are doing uh, a harmful ventilation in some of them for because the compliance, the compliance is different. And the compliance of a young person is not the same of the elder, the basal compliance. And maybe this what we call protective is not so protective. This, this, is, a, this is what we learned from ARDS studies, but for non-COVID, and might be different. Or might be there is something that is, uh, is genetically uh, um, already programmed, and then uh, uh, this is something that we have to look at. But, but again, uh, to understand what happens, we need to know the difference between day one and day three or day four. This, this is what, and this was the, my, the design of, my, of the study. We wanted to know, because at least at day three of mechanical ventilation in a patient with ARDS, you still can do something. You can modify something. You can do something. You can, for example, lower the tidal volume, uh, in, try to decrease the the uh, the plateau pressure or even uh, protective uh, extracorporeal membrane membrane treatment circulation. Why not? Very good, very very <clears throat> very interesting. Congratulations in the in the grant. Another question: What is that you are seeing in your post COVID follow up clinic in, in healthcare workers? What are the the, because there's so much, uh, yes. I may say, probably in every city all over the world now we are developing this post-COVID clinic as we see the, the consequences. What, what are the areas? Well, I, when, when, I, when I see these patients and I sometimes I see them, sometimes I, I phone them, uh, the, the patients that, and I still I don't know the proportions of that, eh? I think the Chinese published very recently something, a follow-up of six months, but, but the patients who are persistently sick, they complain of fatigue. A general tremendous fatigue like I have seen in, in the chronic fatigue syndrome. Very similar. I, I know some patients and I have diagnosed in the past patients with uh, chronic fatigue. It is very similar. They do something very... Uh, apparently very simple and, and, and they have to rest. And uh, others have uh, cardiac alterations, arrhythmias uh, that are uh, difficult to, to manage. And uh, I was wondering, and, and importantly, they complain of a strange uh, pain in the thorax. This is also that is very frequent. And since I, I, I have seen a couple very clear with a pericarditis, my understanding, I'm not cardiologist, but uh, I suspect that the virus affects the pericardium 
And pericardium, and the pleura, eh? As a, do you remember the concept of the dry pleuritis? Yes, the viral pleuritis. Yeah. Okay, this is, I think this is a viral, viral pleuritis or pericarditis. With this uh, difficult to understand uh, pain and that uh, sometimes is in relation to the movement, sometimes not. And uh, this, but, but I think that this is not dangerous. This is going to disappear with, within time. The, the similar uh, with uh, the born home disease. I remember the born home. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, and no, very very uh, very interesting. Uh, and and regarding your um, uh, regarding uh, moving into now into the second part of this conversation, that is uh, a little bit of what do we see COVID nineteen in twenty twenty one and having some general discussion and going going through the, okay you have these healthcare workers <clears throat> they have post covid 19 now let's go into um, into how do you see uh, what is your, your feeling with healthcare workers in spain with this because this is with this persistent pressure that we have with more covid cases the hospital because because here in kentucky one of our lead infectious disease persons uh, that was in the in Kentucky die of COVID, then we have the full spectrum. You have the everybody knows a healthcare worker that died. We have in, in every hospital we have healthcare workers that, that die and then you have people that have all these chronic problems and people, uh, uh, and, and everybody knows healthcare workers that decided to have an early retirement. Yes. Uh, yes. Then, then how do you see the, the, the impact? And, and you alluded a couple of times that uh, the government, how do, you, how do you see the impact in, in, in healthcare moving uh, forward for, for, for ICU or for, for anybody in the hospital? Yes. Well, first, first, what I see now in the healthcare personnel is uh, irritability and depression. I have seen some cases of deep depressions because this, this uh, intensity uh, and, uh, is impossible to, to, to sustain. Uh, the brain is impossible to, to accept that. And then they, some of them are depressed, some of them are very tired and uh, am very irritable. I don't know if this is the word in English, but... Uh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, there is irritation. Irritation, they cannot sleep well. So. Um, uh, we cannot find nurses now, very difficult to find nurses. And, and, and the reason is that before the COVID, the Spanish nurses went to, went to United Kingdom mainly and to Germany because they are paid better. And, and for them here was very difficult to have a, a fixed position. And now we cannot find. Uh, and so uh, if this is going to uh, to be maintained this, this COVID situation, which, which is, I suspect, and we, we can discuss that huh, later on, is going to be a, a, a very terrible problem for, for Spain, at least for Spain, for sure, for sure. Uh, the advantage now is that uh, we are better prepared, we have more experience, uh, and now the third wave, is going to be so worst or equally worse compared to the first wave. These are the numbers, but the number of infections that, that are decreasing. So if this is going to, to be for, for some years, this is going to be very difficult. They, they, the, the politicians and the educators will have to change and to perhaps give a, a rapid formation uh, not for years for nurses and to decide something to to to, to have that and and look at that a lot of our nurses are from South America because they were here before eh? so there is a migration from South America to Spain and to Spain to the north of Europe and this is the case with many many physicians as well eh? 
not the percentage is lower, but uh, we have a lot of residents from South America. And then, and, and our residents, when finalized, they, they go out because they are very bad paid. Uh, I think that politicians should use the, the funds that the European Union is going to give us. They told us that next June, I don't understand that. Why next June? Why not now? We need the, we need the money now, not in next June. Well, and uh, they, they will have to invest in, 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 in health, in health, in everything, in, in, in ICU beds, in uh, um, personal, in equipment, and this is, uh, and this at least the, the, the society is in favor of that. This is, but I have seen many bad things from the society as well. Eh? You mentioned that, that um, uh, what happened in, in Christmas and the and the holidays and um, uh, you uh, and this is uh, some people um, because because still the the, the 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 patients that you see in the in the ICU are primarily elderly. Yes, the people but, that complain in the society that they cannot go and go to the to the yeah. for the tapas are the, the young people yeah. they, how do you how do you see this moving forward yeah no the the problem is okay the the um, so the the mean age is lower now in in the icu eh? we we are seeing uh, people with 40 years or not very sick but of course the higher percentage is elderly population. And these people get uh, COVID from probably from youngs or youngs, youngs fa favor the transmission of the disease. They don't understand. So what, what I have seen in, in the society, uh, they think that they will never get the COVID. Is that that they think? And if they will get the COVID, it's not going to be dangerous for, for them. And for that reasons, what they want is to so socialize, despite all they are seeing, because now we have in Spain, 55,000 deaths from the beginning for a, a country of 36 million. This is, is a lot, this is a lot, but they don't care. Uh, I remember very, the, a couple of weeks ago, I went for dinner outside, outside with the mask and everything, and the people were not wearing the outside, I, the, the, the mask, and I told them, please uh, use the, the masks. And they, they were very angry with me, and I had to leave. I had to leave. <laughs> and uh, then uh, Christmas. Christmas was a problem, because Christmas is so implemented in the brain of, of the Spanish people, the, the holidays, the holidays, not the religion, eh? the holidays. And then Christmas is, is shopping, is, uh, means holidays, means stop working, means vacation, okay? And then this is one hand, this is young people, they, they, they want to do that. Second, it's very difficult to explain to the elderly. For example, my mother is 93 and my mother-in-law 92 as well. It was very difficult for them to understand that we were not going to celebrate any, anything this year. And a lot of people that celebrated that, they got infected. And now we are seeing the consequence of, of that. This was Christmas. <laughs> this is this society now uh, going back to another topic that, that you mentioned that uh, the change in education uh, uh, how do you see because everybody agreed that, that probably this online uh, form of education is going to stay here but, but, but at some point you mentioned that the, the professor is no longer in the classroom um, how, how, do you, how do you see this moving forward? You're in charge of education at the University of Barcelona and, and, 
So what is the, the, the discussion? Medical, how do you think medical education moving forward? Well, I, I think that we will keep with the lectures uh, stream or uh, line or, and, uh, but we will do uh, seminars uh, with the presence of the professor to, to solve doubts, for example. I think is this is going to be much more uh, efficient, probably, because if you record the lecture, everything you use the slides that you could use in the class, and and third that they never ask anything <laughs> before, eh? they never ask it anything. Then I think that we can save that time, uh, even to to prepare better the lectures, and then to meet them in seminars or small, small with small groups that uh, to, to resolve doubts or to, to, to uh, review in, in depth other, other aspects. So this is going to, to be, for although the university wants the presence of the professor, this is the, the university wants. Yeah, yeah but some, some of these changes are here to stay. Yeah. I think so. Yes. I think so. Never, Julio. Importantly, we are we are not going to travel anymore for lectures. Probably, and this is good because remember, at the last time I met you was in I think was in Saudi Arabia or in. Do you remember? Yes, yes. yes. in that pneumococcal pneumococcal. So traveling to to the other part of the world to give a lecture that you can do and then you can answer all the questions perfectly is a lot of time. No, for, for us, this is a relief. No, 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 no question. No question. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, <clears throat> and then going back to, um, uh, going back to, to COVID, a little bit with uh, COVID, you mentioned that, that it is continue for, for a couple of years. When, when a lot of people say that, that they were looking at this year, the end of COVID, that with all these variants that we have from South Africa and Brazil and, and, and England, then uh, you can be thinking that this may continue uh, for some time. Now, going back to, 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 to COVID and, and your uh, research, how do you, how do you see um, the possibility you mentioned steroids is one way of treatment, but it's not too uh, impressive. How do you see this coming? It's going to be it's going to be more like an antiviral. Why is going to make or that, uh, better? Some antiviral, some yeah. blocking the immune response, improving ventilation. What is the hmm. uh, well, steroids are useful for several patients and and we see a lot of patients that improve rapidly. I think that we have to know more about phenotypes in, in, in whom, in which uh, steroids can work better or not. This is important. We don't know that. Okay, this is one thing, but steroids work in the more severe population and you have, but you, you, can, you have seen that the alive versus death in our population is different in relation to corticosteroids. The second are antivirals. We need new antivirals. Uh, yesterday, I, you don't know if you see uh, the news, there is a Spanish investigator in Mount Sinai, is, uh, I don't remember the name now, with a new antiviral, uh, 100 times more potent than uh, Remdesivir, uh, that uh, uh, clears uh, COVID completely in, in, in mice. Mm, we need something like that in the first period. And then in the period of inflammation, of course, we need to, to use uh, uh, anti-inflammatory, specific anti-inflammatory drugs mm, to, to, to block the inflammatory response without being harmful for the patient, which is the other thing. If tocilizumab is, uh, uh, is, let's say, effective, no? Let's say effective, but... Uh, what we are seeing with tocilizumab is much more infections. Candidemia, for example, in um, I, re I revised a, a paper of that. It was very clear the increased infection. So we need antivirals from the very beginning, uh, new antivirals. 
And then <clears throat> uh, before I let you go, I need to ask you uh, what, what happened in, in Spain with the vaccines? Well, uh, the vaccines, because, uh, <laughs> if, if you remember, I, I, in the list of my questions with pharmaceuticals, because I, I was at the very beginning and with all the input of pharmaceuticals, I applauded pharmaceuticals. I think, but I was probably wrong. I was wrong because behind is always the, the interest of the industry and the, and the money. But I think pharmaceuticals have done a lot because they, they pro proportionate a lot of input for trials and a lot of them, I mean, I am very helpful. But now what is happening with vaccines? We don't get the vaccines now because AstraZeneca said that uh, change uh, uh, what he dealt with the European Union well, and, and Pfizer stopped the production or reduced the production. What is happening? That means that uh, these industries are negotiating with, uh, ne with other countries. We, we need to know that the European Union is very angry with, uh, with Astra. Eh? With Astra, what is behind this? <clears throat> it has, yes, it, well, uh, transparency has not been really. No, you, you, although, although a lot of people from the industry are very honest. Eh? Yeah. Of course. No, no, I'll say that regarding, regarding some, some of these uh, transactions are, are at every level. Ah, we, we know. These are at a high, very high level, these trans transactions. Yeah. We don't know anything about that. And now they were saying in the, in the radio this, this morning that I, I just received one dosage eh, of the vaccine and I have to receive the, the second next Tuesday. So that it is not sure that we have vaccines for the second dosage. They said that. Um, then we have to keep uh, waiting for the product. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's interesting. Because, now, uh, another uh, comment. With so many trials, because every week there is a new trial, there is now this trials for, from all the way to doing vaccine studies to do antiviral studies, immunomodulatory studies. Um, how do you decide what trial to do in your institution? Do you mean what, what is the, I don't, I, I do you have, do you have, I was talking to, to, um, to Mike Niederman the other day uh, and, and, and they have put together a, um, a committee to decide who is doing what trial. Uh, and I found this um, interesting because at least in my experience, we always know the industry contact one investigator, the investigator decided yes or no, uh, but there are so uh, many. This is, this is a still individual, individual. The, the, the industry contacts the investigation. And now, if you decide to go ahead, well, there is a committee in the hospital and that you have to inform that committee, but you are free to send uh, the protocol to the IRB. Especially at the beginning was very individual. Now it's better organized and, and there is a committee that decides if uh, the, the, the hospital is going to participate or not. This is, this is now. Yeah, because this is a, a new way to look at all this, because again, traditionally it was being, you know, people, select one investigator, you decide yeah. but now hospitals have developed more and more committees to organize all the research activities because we are going to keep doing research in COVID for, for a long time. For a long time. No, you, and, I, and I think I agree about having committees to decide because uh, of, in these committees are experts, they can um, decide the, the most interesting trials or the potentially more, more effective for the patients at the end. Because there are some trials where with uh, are going to fail or very difficult to understand. Yeah. Uh, and and going into clinical trials, um, it was you know, sometimes the the steroid trial, the the, the sometimes for immunomodulators and all these clinical outcomes that that they go from this ordinary scale that the patient yeah. is on low flow oxygen, high flow oxygen, a ventilator and then you move back and forth. Uh, this has been something, you no, know, we have not done this in pneumonia. 
No, uh, never. We never did that in pneumonia. I think this is a type of invention, no? Yeah, well, what is your, uh, because again, there's a lot of discussion with people doing trials in pneumonia. Now, these new outcomes with this way or you go oh, to point this well, way. You know, you know what, what, what happened? That, uh, what happened? That pneumonia was something managed by, by some infectologists, no? A lot of pulmonologists and uh, an intensivist when the pneumonia was severe. I, th I think that, the, but not infectologist eh? at all, except you are an exception. <laughs> no, no, you are a good exception because um, you you funded Capo and, and you follow up and there is a school uh, of the, the Capo story, no? But not the others. The others are pulmonologists and, and, and in Europe as well, in Spain, all over the, and then, and then most of the pulmonologists, now infectologists are now, deciding an epidemiologist and they don't know about pneumonia they should go go well look look back and to see what what the, the because indeed this is a pneumonia this is a viral pneumonia no it's plain and simple say viral pneumonia yes it is is a clear viral pneumonia but then we have to 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 use what we did for pneumonia and what we learn? Do you think that this this uh, outcome? Because uh, uh, when I look at these clinical outcomes, say, oh, the patient is admitted with COVID because the diagnosis is you have a positive PCR, you have COVID. Now, in our hospital, I don't know what is the experience in your hospital, uh, a percentage of the patients get admitted with COVID uh, really they don't have pneumonia, but the reason for admission is something that is not related to COVID. They just have a positive PCR and they have COVID, but they were admitted for trauma with a patient, the trauma unit or patient with cerebrovascular accident, that they have COVID and they are enrolled in COVID studies. Shouldn't it be the case that to be in a COVID study, you're supposed to have pneumonia? I think so. I think so. Admitted for pneumonia. Yes. Admitted. The trials should include not, not patients with another disease that you perform a PCR and they are positive because this is going to uh, bias the, the the population at the results. Um, yes. Okay, but then essentially you found all these clinical outcomes in these published studies a little bit. Uh, uh, no, but the, the bad thing is that uh, they are using this classification for trials. Yes. And if you, if you look at the scores of 30 day mortality, a still PSI, in COVID, eh, is one of the best. Yes. Be very similar to others that combine several things and put together. Yeah, so, back to the you to, no, you have to use PSI. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a viral pneumonia. It's a severe yeah, virus. Exactly. It's a viral pneumonia. Okay, well, uh, we've been discussing for one hour. Uh, as always, it's been a, a pleasure to, to have you and to get your 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 experience, probably we are going to repeat this in some time as you evolve with this uh, very you know. study. Uh, keep, keep very safe uh, and healthy. Okay, we, we keep in contact. Uh, and I want to thank everybody that is listening to these uh, conversations. And I will always mention that if someone have any specific question for you, Tony, please uh, we are going to uh, send an email or contact yes. me. Yes. No problem. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Be safe. Bye. Thank you.